Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation, Emerging Field of Food Safety Forensics. This presentation will be audio broadcast into your computer speakers, so please make sure that your speakers are turned on and the volume is set to a comfortable level. This webinar is structured to provide critical insight into the emerging fields of food science forensics and food safety forensics, the difference between human blood DNA and microorganism DNA, how proven detection and analytical tools can be used during the investigation of food contamination and poisoning cases to help attorneys become more stressful in court, and whether the manufacturer had a pattern of creating favorable environments for potentially growing and harboring these organisms. Today our presenter is Dr. Daryl Suderman. Dr. Suderman is the president of Food Technical Consulting and has worked for food manufacturing and leading restaurant teams for over 20 years. For the last seven years, Dr. Suderman has served as an expert witness consultant for both plaintiff and defense attorneys throughout the United States. He received his BS and MS degrees in agricultural education and his Ph.D. in food science from Kansas State University. Dr. Suderman holds two U.S. patents. He's co-authored a book, a food processing book, and has written over 40 peer-reviewed and trade magazine articles and white papers. He has worked in research and development, quality assurance, and food safety for many of the leading restaurant teams, including Kentucky Fried Chicken, Boston Market, Church's Chicken, Quiznos, Pack and D's, Chick-fil-A, and Wendy's International. For CLE credit today, for certain states, they do require a passcode. Uh, during the presentation, I'll make an announcement for you to put in the passcode into the chat feature, which is located to the right over here. And during the presentations, we, we do uh, request if you have any questions, feel free to put those questions into the chat feature also on the right-hand side. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. Suderman. Well, welcome uh, to the seminar today, and uh, welcome also to the emerging field of food safety forensics. I've been enamored with this topic for some time, and after working in the food manufacturing industry for 25 years, during that time I have witnessed and participated in the development of HACCP, SSOP, GMP, and other food safety programs. The evolution of these programs has been slow but steady and has grown from simple to sophisticated. All programs that have developed have had the foundation of genuine human concern for safety. But times have changed. Regulatory pressure has increased. And now the legal system is stepping into the arena of criminal prosecution, as witnessed by the Jensen Farms Mellon case right here in Colorado where I live. This might be a good time to provide you a state of the industry on a global scope. Starting on a local and state level, the food industry is audited by small-scale auditing firms, and principally two larger firms called the American Institute of Baking and Silica Labs. These latter two organizations are hired and paid for by food manufacturing companies. Restaurant companies and others hire auditors to inspect their contract manufacturers on their behalf. It is my understanding that Jensen Farms has been audited by this type of auditor. I have been trained and worked as an auditor, and their primary focus is immediate corrective action and preventative programs, not complete by any means. There is some state monitoring of food safety programs, but it is primarily done by the FDA and USDA federal organizations, and the big difference is the right of these organizations to fine and prosecute. They also place international guidelines onto U.S. companies for doing business in other countries. The larger food companies that trade internationally have been working together on developing of an international organization called the Global Food Safety Initiative that has approved a small number of food safety programs that are effective but simplify their food safety program monitoring. But even large companies can hide from international visibility, like IKEA, when they were called to task for serving meatballs with horse meat. This case exposes the weakness of the international food supply process and has brought about better systems in their organization.
This chart shows a cross-section of pathogen incidence over the past 20 years. It's interesting that vibrio species are found mostly in raw and undercooked shellfish. It shows that salmonella incidence, and all of these are food pathogens that can make someone sick, in most cases cause them to die. Salmonella has been fairly flat. Listeria has been trending down, but has received a lot of focus in the meat and poultry industry, and maybe that's a good thing, and the numbers are showing a decline with increased uh, oversight. E. coli has taken a steady, steep upswing lately, and the point of this slide is that we have had, always have had foodborne illnesses, and we will continue to have them. What is forensic science? Forensic science is the application of scientific principles and technological practices to the purposes of justice in a study of resolution of criminal, civil, and regulatory issues. The American Academy of Forensic Sciences has partitioned forensic science into 11 categories. Food science and food safety are not among them, but that is expected to change since this is an emerging category. Other definitions include scientific tests or techniques used in connection with the detection of a crime, relating to the use of scientific knowledge or methods in solving crimes, and the application of scientific knowledge to legal problems, especially scientific analysis of physical evidence. Approximately uh, uh, 11 fields of uh, food forensic science. Uh, first is tech toxicology, and the second is technology. And here I've kind of made a footnote that it involves solving crimes with advanced technology. And as we go through the presentation today, you'll see where those systems of technology are in place in the food industry and can be tapped into um, during investigative work. Reconstruction. I made this bold type too because I really believe that in the future that the food industry um, may have to uh, reconstruct events or put restrictions on people entering or leaving a certain uh, crime scene, if you want to call it, uh, and it warrants that. And then there's odontology, nursing, mathematics, etymology, chemistry, which certainly fits the food science area, and anthropology, but there's no food safety analysis and tracking. And uh, that's something that I believe is going to change. And uh, hopefully you'll see as we go through the presentation today uh, how things are pretty much set up to do that, I believe. What is the history of forensic science? Well, it's not all that old. Except in 1901, Dr. Paul Uhlenhuth developed a method for testing blood stains to determine if they were human. A year later, fingerprinting was introduced to Scotland Yard. 1984, which is fairly recent, Sir Alec Jeffries developed the first DNA profiling test, and he published his findings in 1985. And then in 1987, we had DNA profiling. Dr. Suderman, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Apparently, we're having some issue where... People can't hear you. Um, I'm not really sure why. I tested it before we started the presentation. Everyone, could you just put in the chat feature if you're if you can hear me and Dr. Suderman speaking? Thank you. Maybe what I'll need you to call in to me or something. Okay, we do have individuals, some who can hear, some who can't. So if you if you are having trouble streaming the voiceover IT through your computer, please feel free to call in. There's a 1-800 number. Um, if you go to your communicate button at the top of the screen and click on teleconference, and join teleconference, you'll be able to call in and hear the presentation. And we apologize for the technical difficulty. Dr. Suderman, you can continue. Thank you. 
Okay, I'll just uh, take, a uh, take a second here to finish up the slide here that I'm showing on the history of forensic science. And uh, the last bullet point was the one that uh, we failed to mention. And in 1999, Dr. Lawrence Farwell developed a technique for Farwell brain fingerprinting, which is a new computer-based method, and three-dimensional laser scanners are expected to, to uh, replace microscopes in the near future. So the next question we have is, what is food safety forensics? Food safety forensics is the methodology of using food safety principles, detection methods, and processes to solve crimes or to verify and document food poisoning. That includes both human and pet. It is specific to food microorganism poisoning. For example, the detection and tracking of pathogenic organisms in a fruit like melons that result in consumer deaths. Or it represents the discipline methodology for identifying the food poisoning case and contributing factors and identifies the sequence of tracking and tracing investigative steps, technologies, and detection tools. How does food safety forensics differ from other forensic sciences? Food safety forensics differs from other nine forensic sciences in that it is food. Like pharmaceutical drugs, it is ingested into the human body. Food is a matter of life and death. Food is also very perishable, which means it has a very short shelf life, and its quote-unquote fingerprints vanish very quickly. Food safety forensics uses multiple methodologies from the other forensic sciences, as I've talked about in a previous slide. And food safety forensics methodology must track through the entire farm-to-fork supply chain, and we'll be talking more about that as we go uh, this afternoon. What are some food safety forensics applications? I've listed a few for us to consider. One is fresh fruit or fresh vegetables, both raw meat and poultry, seafood, organic foods, natural foods, restaurants and grocery delis. As you'll see from this list, most of the products that are perishable are the fruit, vegetables, and meat. And these are the ones that generally have the uh, microorganism uh, poisoning effects on them. It's important to note that most of these food categories represent highly perishable food items. What are some of the food safety forensic expert witness skill set requirements? A food safety forensic expert should be competent in the following skill areas. And you'll notice that it's much broader than just being able to identify microorganisms. One, I personally believe they need to have a general understanding of FDA and USDA regulatory requirements. A background with some food microbiology experience is also beneficial. Especially helpful is food plan experience. And then an understanding of HACCP and food safety systems and different HACCP program requirements. Also, manufacturing software systems, product recall experience, supply chain software systems, and we'll talk about this again. It's the farm-to-fork scope of forensic science. And then working with the knowledge of tracking, tracing, GS1 barcoding, and in the pharmaceutical industry, what they call e-pedigree technology systems. What are some benefits of food safety forensics methodology? In addition to the traditional food pathogen information, there's also location mapping of food pathogens throughout the supply chain of a product that has this particular incident uh, associated with it. Food pathogen genealogy mapping is a part of this too. Location mapping of the food pathogen throughout the food processing plant and data documentation of food pathogen life cycle. What are some of the traditional legal approaches that have been used previously? Well, in most situations, in most legal cases, 
It's what pathogen caused the sickness outbreak. So we're talking about just a specific organism here. Were other pathogen strains present? What was the pathogen population? Where was the pathogen located? Was an approved HACCP plan followed? Was an incident management plan executed? Or what were the food processing plant environmental conditions? How well was the recall managed? By taking the food safety forensics approach, I'm suggesting the following new legal approaches. First of all, food contamination tracking and tracing both upstream and downstream in what is commonly known as the supply chain. In other words, what was the condition of strawberries picked in a field in Salinas, California? How were they sorted and graded and washed and held at what temperature and stored and distributed? Did executive negligence occur? In other words, Jensen Mellon case in Colorado. And I put a question mark there because both of the owner's brothers have been prosecuted in, as criminals. Did temperature abuse occur upstream or downstream based on the data capture? So what are some of the fundamentals of food safety forensics? One is process documentation documenting the ingredient supply chain, fingerprinting, temperature tracking, country of origin tracking. It becomes much more than just an organism, but it's looking at the whole supply chain and the data throughout that supply chain. This is just a model, a visual model, the food safety forensics methodology model. What I'm trying to emphasize here is the farm-to-fork supply chain. This is the entire forensic scope that needs to be considered. When we talk about food safety forensic fingerprinting, it is a collection of vital, unique data stored in a fingerprint like a food ingredient origin, whether it's domestic or international. Its fingerprint would also include ingredient processing data, finished product processing data, work in progress, what they call WIP genealogy, and I'll talk a little bit more about genealogy tracking, the inventory history, and the distribution history. This slide shows the difference in the similarities of human and food forensics. The similarity is that both fields of study use DNA as the baseline. The difference is that DNA is found in the human body versus microorganisms. At this point, we'll take a pause in my presentation to see if there's any questions so far from the attendees. Okay, uh, our first question is, why are you expounding a forensic approach to food contamination cases? I'm expounding a harder edge approach because food contamination was long considered an accident, quote unquote, that happened, and it was unintentional. Now food contamina contamination cases are also being prosecuted with criminal intent. As a result, attorneys and expert witnesses need a lot more information to determine whether contamination was an accident or resulted from purposeful intent. Okay. We do have another question, but we do want to take um, this opportunity for anybody who needs CLE credit to please put in the code, the tax code that we announced at the beginning of the presentation at this time. Okay, we're going to ask our next question, Dr. Suderman. Why do you talk so much about farm-to-fork supply chain data tracking? It is my opinion that most previous food adulteration and contamination cases represented a point-in-time incident. But that is way too simplistic for today's prosecution world. We need to do more than just prove a pathogen organism was present. 
and document subtype DNA matches. Now we need to track causative sequence of events, and we need to be able to track the complete history of every ingredient through the manufacturing and distribution of a finished product. Another important enabler of tracking causative agents through the supply chain is because the food industry has finally emerged from the dark ages into IT system software world. In many cases, data is being tracked continuously throughout the supply chain. Attorneys need expert witnesses that understand databases and software so they can get access to the data to help them build their case and win in court. Okay, and we have one more question. Do you actually foresee the recreation or recreation, I'm sorry, of crime scenes in food manufacturing plants or eating establishments? Yes, I do. And because it, uh, there is a tendency to immediately clean up the food contaminated area in food processing plants now. But to some attorneys, that could represent a cover up. This is a difficult legal area that will require further definition. If there's going to be criminal prosecution, then we need to make sure that evidence is not washed down the drain. It further highlights the role of police investigators and food scientists. And that's a topic for another day. Okay, terrific. Uh, that's all the questions we have for this break at the moment, so we'll continue on with the presentation. Food Safety Forensics has three core processes that interface with each other. They are trackback, traceability, and genealogy, and I will define their functions in the following slides. I'm sure many of you have heard these terms in reading articles just in maybe newspapers, Wall Street Journal, other business publications. But um, hopefully when uh, I get done talking here, you'll have a little bit better understanding and uh, you'll see, see some value that you can add to your cases, casework. But tracking, traceability, and genealogy um, are important to know each of these processes is directly related to some foundational IT software support system. Usually that support starts with a database, either non-relational or relational. As a food forensic scientist, it is important to define the sources that feed the database, determine whether some data is analyzed and reported. The reports will probably provide the greatest value to your investigation, and they are easier to understand for non-IT trained personnel. Let's begin with food trackback what it's defined at. Product trackback enables food processors to sequentially track process deviations or product variances back to ingredient suppliers or other hidden implant processing enemies. And I define process enemies as those food agents that are either deteriorate the food, shorten its shelf life, change the quality or appearance of the food, or contaminate the food product. For example, bacon quality changes for a pork processor in Europe in recent years were tracked back to the feed ration changed by the hog farmer that used a ration with a higher concentration of linoleic acid, believe it or not. We, product trackback is also critical to identifying the entry points of microbiological contamination, bone and glass fragments, and bioterrorism poisons. But trackback should not be confused with process verification, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Trackback is reinforced by products subject to trackback are not necessarily a consumer health risk, but these are products that have unacceptable quality issues. The bacon example that I presented is not that extreme. If you consider that the color of eggs and chicken legs can be altered with a diet change, so can the fat or oil in a hog's diet change the firmness and flavor of pork fat. Track backing. Three letters to remember. M, M, V. First of all, track backing maps the manufacturing process. Second, it measures the manufacturing process performance. And three, it verifies process compliance, what I call process verification. Track backing has more to do with process of making a product 
than a related term called traceability, which places more focus on the product and the finished product. In even simpler terms, traceability will use barcodes. It is more electronic. Process verification represents a quality management system that follows standard operating procedures, best management practices, and asset principles. Process verification is typically more detailed and more interdependent than traceability. Under process verification plans, animals must be raised according to USDA-approved specifications and guidelines. Genealogy is the tracking of a product's assembly through the manufacturing process. It supports the ability to do the following and tracks historical production events. It tracks information about components assembled into a finished food product, in other words, different ingredients or sub-ingredients. It verifies that all required ingredients are assembled at the start of the production assembly operation. Another term for this is called staging. It also places ingredients on hold to prevent quality issues. Genealogy also relates to the loading and replenishment ingredients during the production process. It determines the supplier information for failed components. And it can produce reports detailing exactly which ingredients were assembled into a given SKU or product number. The term genealogy is synonymous with the word historical or production events or event logging. To give you an example, a food company could attribute a product failure to electrical outlet, outlet, outage. The electrical outage would be a negative production event. So just kind of keep the word in mind in events or process when you think about genealogy and how that could affect um, a food contamination case. Genealogy provides control of ingredients, consumption, and with or work in progress accuracy. It improves ingredient traceability and compliance with customer requirements regarding change control and shipping. It provides visibility into the current state, status, and assembly or location of the food product. The activities that have been logged for the product and all manufacturing personnel who have worked on a product. It involves the issue of tracking processes, resources, tools, and materials used during the manufacture of a product. It also provides visibility and traceability into the complete product life cycle from inception to finished product storage and distribution. Using data collection processes, the system requires a comprehensive history of every ingredient used for the manufacture of a product and the events during the production process and provides data for analysis. It allows you to trace component issues quickly, efficiently, and precisely to the point of use in all products. For example, if a product fails, it can be traced back to where the product was made, how it was made, and with what components it was made, even down to the vendor of each ingredient. When diagnosing which ingredient or process failed, you can find all events and equipment settings where a similar process setting was used thus enabling the identification of a defective process setting or ingredient during upstream food product manufacturing and locate the failure point more quickly. In other words, there could have been a ma machine failure that caused the contamination of a food product. Genealogy is more about the process in production plant versus the product, which is track back. Now let's define food traceability. I'm sure you've heard this, this term before. Food traceability is the process of tracking a product's history and sharing that data along the entire processing path, the so-called farm-to-fork or field-to-plate programs. Ideally, traceback allows the consumer or processor to track a cut of meat or a package of food from the grocery store from which the product was purchased all the way back to the farm the field, the processing plant where it was originated. The main traceability benefit for consumers and food processors is food safety, or more specifically, the assurance of food safety. 
Processors can take advantage of traceability programs to enhance the quality of their products. Food traceability goes outside the production and plant scope. It encompasses the entire supply chain from sourcing an ingredient like curry powder in India, shipping the curry powder to the United States in a shipping container, entering a border patrol point of entry, transporting the port of entry from the port of entry to the U.S. manufacturing customer, inventory stocking, production line staging, production of the finished product, packaging, palleting, distribution to DCs, and delivery to the consumer. Retail sales are sent to another consumer as a subsequent ingredient. What are some of the benefits to a food safety forensic case? Well, I personally believe it increases the court success rate because justification data is more accurately detailed. It provides incident data that is mapped to FDA and USDA regulations and provides protection from the hint, even the hint of criminality. When we look at integrated food tracking and tracing components, there's several to consider. One is electronic production, quality, and asset data collection. Second is what they call centralized relational databases. And, the, and this is kind of an IT term, but it's the difference between a relational and a non-relational database is you can think of an Excel spreadsheet on your computer as being a non-relational. It's a flat file database, so to speak. Relational allows you to compare a certain time of day with an incident that occurred in a production plant that caused a product failure. So it, it allows you to make relationships and compare, or relationship comparisons it really is what it's about. You also, it involves integrated um, RF scanning and barcode tracking system. The barcode Information Management System, BCIM, that is integrated with a centralized relational database within the MES and ERP environments. And again, MES refers to Manufacturing Execution Systems, and ERP, many people know SAP company, to provide enterprise resource planning environments. It also is a centralized portable portal for accessing and reporting information to multiple users across the entire organization from even remote locations in other parts of the world. What is incoherent forensic data? Most product tracking plans used by food processor product recalls fall short during compressed recall time frames for the following reasons. One, most food safety data is collected, stored, and retrieved manually, not electronically. Most electronic or manual HACCP or quality management programs are only point solutions and they are not integrated. Most food companies are not capable of feeding information from barcode scanners directly into their ERP business transaction and data warehouse systems. And most food companies cannot track finished goods down to the individual case level as required for a thorough product recalls. Now, I'm making those um, comments basically on the food industry, but we'll talk about the pharmaceutical industry a little bit that is a, a, a model in this area and far ahead of where the food industry is. This is, uh, when we look at the food forensic model application, we have uh, uh, food organic, fresh organic poultry and sealed film containing three pathogen organisms, E. coli, Clostridium perfringens, and Salmonella. And at this point in my presentation, I want to make a transition from the food forensic model for perishable foods, as I just mentioned, to the pharma forensic model. Why? Because it's the best model for the industry to use and to anticipate in future FDA regulations. Remember, food is ingested just like drugs, and it makes sense to manage food like pharmaceutical drugs. So let's take a look at the pharmaceutical model. The number of drug counterfeit cases has skyrocketed in the past 20 years, and who would think fraud would be, be prevalent? But it is. 
And as we all know, the reason for that is because illegal and legal drugs represent high monetary value. One of the areas of great fraud within the pharmaceutical area is what they call pharmacy compounding. This is a practice in which a licensed pharmacist combines mixes and alters ingredients in response to a prescription to create a medication tailored to the medical needs of an individual patient. Pharmaceutical compounding is done properly can serve as an important public health need if a patient cannot be treated with an FDA-approved medication but it can also be wrapped with fraud. As a result, the pharma industry has had to implement traceability, trackback, and genealogy processes. That is why the pharma industry is the best model for the food industry. If you can't read the details on this uh, particular slide, I'll go over them in the next slide, but this is a what they call an e-pedigree, and this is a benchmarking tool uh, for ship for preparing and shipping in uh, different pharmaceutical products throughout the industry. Pharma E pedigree benchmarking contains the following tracking and tracing information on a sheet that I just showed you. It includes a pedigree serial number, the buyer and seller license number, the transition number, the authentication person contact information, the lot number, the expiration date, all of the above apply to both seller and buyer. This is an example of the pharmaceutical supply chain. You'll notice on the left-hand side of this slide, it talks about, it shows a box level tracking, and then a bundle level, and then the individual pill bottle unit. On the right side, it talks, shows the manufacturer who, who uh, produces the product, attaches an e-pedigree, sent to a distributor or two, and then to the pharmacy, and the pharmacy receives the shipment with an e-pedigree file. That's why I really believe that the pharmaceutical industry is a great benchmarking uh, tool for the food industry. I'm just going to go through a little bit of um, some of the pharma track and trace technologies that are being used right now uh, because some of these are starting to enter the food industry and it will continue to. The first I mentioned is the uh, radio frequency ID technology. You probably can't see the picture, but if you order a, you know, request a set of the slides, uh, you'll be able to see that. Um, tamper evident packaging is another technology. Another one is called Puff Technology. The fourth is what they call both two-dimensional and three-dimensional barcoding. Sometimes holograms are used on uh, pill bottles. Then barcoded with an image, a synthetic DNA signature, and serialization. What is pharmaceutical serialization? And this really represents the best that's available in the pharmaceutical and the food industry right now. Well, in March of 2010, the FDA issued its guidance on serialization, defining the concept of a standard numerical identifier, SNI. Europe has been requiring SNIs for years now. The decision by California Pharmacy Board to push back its e-pedigree requirement provides the industry the chance to implement the necessary systems to comply. SNI solutions go far beyond the technology itself. Subsumed with the decision to implement SNI scheme are the following activities. One, to establish the security framework for data exchange. Two, to record the retention policies. Three, to implement of SNIs at the pallet and case level. The next is to standardize the chain of custody data to be tracked by logistical units, followed by the standardization of electronic data exchange format for data carriers with specific encoded formats identified. 
or guidelines for reporting exceptions noted by supply chain participants. The hierarchy of SNIs expected in a shipment. And then mandatory serialization will be here sooner rather than later. And developing the necessary support systems as part of anti-counterfeiting strategy will be position an organization to meet the impending e-pedigree requirements in 2015. So within two years, the pharmaceutical industry is, is requiring serialization process within their industry. Before we take additional questions, let's ask one last overriding question. Why is it important? In my opinion, it's important for food safety, uh, forensics, because the legal landscaping is transitioning to more of a criminal, food criminal prosecutions. And with this, with this is a challenge to find evidence of criminal intent. As you all know, criminal intent is hard to prove. But taking a more holistic view of the farm to fork food chain enables us to document events prior to the problem and research responsibility. And with pharma serialization SNI and e-pedigree tools, we can get the information to prosecution or defend your cases. Thank you very much. Brooke, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, we do have quite a few questions, but before we get into the conclusion and question portion of the presentation, we want to ask uh, each attendee to please put in the code for the CLE credit that we uh, gave to you at the beginning of the presentation and in the middle of the presentation. So we'll take a moment just to allow our attendees to put in that code at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for putting in the code. We do have a couple questions uh, from the audience here, Dr. Sumerin. Uh The first one is, is there a step in the processing of food where pathogens would be most likely to cause contamination? You know, that's a good question, but here's the way I look at, um, at that. Each pathogen has its own optimum environment, so to speak the type of nutrients that it requires, the water activity of the food itself, and the moisture content, the fat content. So I, I, don't, I look at a little difference, um, and that is it has to be very specific to the organism, and I think it will provide in the long term a more efficient uh, investigative process. Okay. I have another question. When food contamination occurs with imported foods, is the tracking process similar? It, it is. But unfortunately, I have to tell you that it, it's still not a perfect uh, process yet. And the, and the one that uh, really brings it home, I think, is the case of uh, horse meat being detected in IKEA uh, meatballs. And uh, it, IKEA isn't known, you know, they're known more for their furniture than their food, but they do sell 150 million meatballs a year. And um, they, you know, looking back at, at Okia and what their problems were is they had multiple suppliers. Now they've dropped it from 15 to 7. And um, they just were not keeping data the way they should have. And uh, I think that's just kind of a good example where, where the average person can kind of relate to, you know, how did that happen? Well, there was just overlooked and neglect, and, um, but they're getting it right now. Okay. There's a question in relation to, to the IKEA situation. Uh, the question is, how was it brought to light that there was indeed horse meat in, in their meatballs? Um, I could be wrong, but I, I think what happened was that uh, 
some endeavoring uh, uh, graduate student or professor at university was actually just doing some uh, checking of meat products that they pulled off the grocery store shelves and uh, happened to find it and um, contacted the right agency to get get the publicity about it and um, uh, the case was off and running. Okay, now um, this is a question actually from Tasha. How does a company that is so large, like IKEA, handle that type of situation and control the fire that's already started with something like that? You know, I'll be honest with you. I think it really caught IKEA off guard. Uh, like I said, um, they are not known as a food company like a, an international brand like General Mills, uh, Kellogg, uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and probably did not have a quality assurance or research and development staff that uh, was trained to put some of these modern practices in place. And it is somewhat understandable from the standpoint is that, you know, I consider myself to be a, a real hybrid and the fact that I actually worked doing IT consulting for 10 years plus 20 years working in R&D in a food company as a Ph.D. in food science. And uh, there's just not a lot of people that can draw that connection, and that's why I was interested in making this presentation to kind of plant some seeds in people's minds and to open their vision of, of uh, how, just how big and how complex this is, can be. Okay. We have a question from an attendee, Mr. Robert Miller. He wants to know, are holding temperatures critical for retail food sales and how is it determined to be the culprit? Well, yes, they are. To answer the question uh, directly, they are responsible, um, and you do need to stay within the 140 or out of the 140 and the 41 degree uh, temp Fahrenheit temperature range. Um, and how do you, you know, keep track of? Uh, of whether they're meeting uh, the regular, you know, the requirements and stuff. Well, first of all, it would help to have uh, an analog temperature recorder that continues to record temperature maybe every minute or, or every second. Uh, and all the restaurant chains that I've worked for, I haven't seen this. Um, but at the same time, um, you can look at patterns of uh, and frequency of how often the temperature was checked. Uh, obviously, the right thing to do would be if you're having issues with not meeting temperature, and that is somewhat common in the, in the restaurant business, to be frank, um, then you need to increase your temperature uh, recording uh, moments, so to speak, and uh, or make permanent changes in the, or, or just replace the, the heater or the freezer unit that's used in a restaurant. Okay. We have another question from attendee Jill. She asks, have you ever seen an issue with contamination over the use of food-grade oil and non-food-grade oils on equipment and plants? If so, are there any laws or guidelines companies must follow? You know, I haven't, I'm not aware of situations with oils. And early in my career, I actually worked for a company that had a large part of their business in, in fats and oils. Uh, dirty foods. Um, oils just aren't usually associated with the environmental conditions that microorganisms love to grow in. Um, if there's contamination, it might be through entry of other options, uh, objects that have the oil or processing line, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I can't give you much help on that one. Okay. We have a couple more questions. Have you talked to the American Academy of Food Sciences about establishing a new food science field? I, I have, and the the, um, the dialogue has just begun. I'm uh, going through the process now to uh, uh, go to join as a kind of in their general area, uh, but this is uh, kind of new to them, and uh, it's going to take some more discussions. But uh, we've I've begun the process and. Uh, I think uh, once other people and other members and board of directors start to realize and understand the importance of food 
and uh, the safety risk to the human population are going to uh, be uh, receptive, and um, hopefully someday we'll have a separate science field in the food science forensics. Okay, we have another question. What can the food industry learn from the pharmaceutical industry? I think they can learn a lot. The farm industry is being led by proposed California regulations for anyone who lives in California or works in California are probably aware of that. Uh, the e-pedigrees and product serialization. Uh, most of these regulatory documents, technologies, and regulations can be and will eventually be applied to the food industry. I would say one of the reasons that it's slow in the food industry is that the food industry has been slow to implement software systems and databases that can record information, track it, report on it, and uh, it, it's just taking time. Uh, but eventually, uh, I think we're going to be required to hold to the same standards as pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Do you have any other examples of recent food cases that have stretched across the food industry besides the IKEA case? Probably only one is the, the Jensen Farms smelling case here in Colorado, and um, I think it's entering the, the sentencing stage now. Uh, I think they pleaded guilty, but, uh, boy, did it, did it really open up my eyes as an expert witness that um, um, it's, it, it's, it's serious when people die and when people get sick, and... Uh, now it's becoming, okay, we're going to start holding people responsible, and it's not going to be uh, low-level people in QA labs that uh, are writing the, the QA data into the laboratory notebooks. All right, and we have another question, actually, about trans fat. Um, how will the trans fat issue, the fact that um, now it's being banned, I should say, um, affect the food industry? You know, when I worked for a couple restaurant chains, I was particularly the last one, uh, Church's Chicken in Atlanta, for about four years. Uh, we transitioned from uh, um, trans fats to non-trans fat uh, oil. We we required our suppliers at fried chicken, like Tyson Foods, to have trans fat-free oil. And um, uh, I think that uh, most companies, have already made that transition, and I don't see much of a problem for that to happen. I expect it to be pretty smooth and uh, incident-free, to be honest with you. Will that actually increase the cost of food production? You know, it could, but, you know, with uh, U.S. and international ingenuity, um, when you close down one product category, uh, we have a tendency to be creative and productive and, and uh, expanding another one. And a lot of times cost is all based on volume. And uh, if 100% of all the business in the future is trans fat free, um, then the price will, I think, come down and uh, moderate to close to where it is now. I really don't think it's going to be a problem. And in regards to your research on um, a specific food team, you know, what could you give some examples about some of the the work that you've done for those corporations? Uh, specifically, I assume restaurants. Um, they're they're seeing, yeah. uh, mainly doing product development uh, is is one of the areas of responsibility. The other is. Uh, monitoring quality assurance programs and, um, and auditing uh, food manufacturing locations, whether it be a, uh, a fresh lettuce plant in Salinas, California that uh, had to audit, or whether it's uh, one of about 20 different poultry processing plants that I had to audit. I mean, that was another part of it in this part. And then also to uh, create um, policy when it comes to quality assurance and food safety. Um, one area that um, of, of interest to me is that some of these uh, uh, CEOs of large food companies now are, are beginning to in, put together uh, teams of people that are experts in food safety to provide yearly audits 
over their own personnel. And uh, I think that's a good idea, but where I see them missing in just about every situation is they, they bring no consideration into the, um, the IT skill levels that we talked about today in tracking and tracing and that kind of thing. And again, it's, it's loaded with um, a lot of university professors. They have degrees in microbiology. So there's still some evolution that needs to take place to improve those processes. Okay, well, uh, that's all the questions we have for today. Did you want to add anything else to the end of the presentation, Dr. Suderman? I just uh, want to thank everyone for attending. We had a great attendance today, and uh, uh, if you have any specific questions, uh, I think Brooke will tell you how you can reach me through TASA. And we'll yeah, I'm going to take the presentation back, and we'll, we'll uh, let our attendees know what the next step is. Once again, this uh, course is eligible for CLE credit in California, Illinois, New Jersey, Missouri, Minnesota, and Texas. To ensure that you've received your CLE credit for today's presentation, please make sure you complete the survey that comes up in your web, web browser once we've concluded the presentation. The TACA group, in addition to being the best source for testifying and consulting experts, please keep in mind that TASA also offers e-discovery and document management solutions. We do offer other free interactive webinars and research reports on expert witnesses, the Talent History Report 2.0, the Professional Sanction Search, and the Expert Witness Profile. Tomorrow morning, I will send out a link to an archive recording of this presentation, and you'll also receive a link to the PowerPoint, uh, which, in addition to being emailed to you, it will be located on TASA's website in the Knowledge Center. If you have any follow-up questions or comments about today's presentation, please email Carol Kowalewski, and her email address is listed there. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Dr. Daryl Suderman for his time and effort in creating the presentation. If you would like to speak with Daryl or a tested representative, please feel free to contact us at 1-800-523-2319. Thank you again, and have a great day.